Today, I'm having a conversation with Benji Backer. Benji started the American Conservation Coalition. Um, Benji is a senior at University of Washington. He's originally from Wisconsin, and he used his upbringing and his love for the great outdoors to become an advocate uh, fighting against climate change and fighting for the environment. And what's unique about Benji is that he's been able to do this in a bipartisan, nonpartisan way. He's found a way to coalesce both liberal and conservative viewpoints and get them to the table um, to, to try to find solutions to a very complex and global problem like climate change. I think you guys are really gonna value this conversation. So check it out. How are you? Good, man. How are you? Thanks for Good, joining. Nice to Likewise. Yeah, yeah I'm really. Friday at fire. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, man. I, I think I'm circling around like four different uh, outfits per week now, and that's a uh, that's about it, and that's stretching it. Yeah, I don't know if I've, you know, I've showered obviously, but I don't know if I've I've done like anything with my hair other than wearing a hat. Yeah. For <laughs> for the past year, I've actually started to stop wearing suits because. I've realized like, what's the point? Yeah. Like I like looking nice for sure, but it's like, why? Like it is such a social construct. It's insane it just to like think about it because it's just a piece of clothing and you're wearing like this little thing that like dangles from your neck and that's supposed to make you look good. And you your start leash. to like think about it and you're like, okay, as an outdoorsy person, should I be wearing a suit to everything? Cause I don't think so. And so I've just been like, all right. So maybe now it'll become more of the norm. I don't know. I, I think it already is. Um, I think Zuckerberg was ahead of his time before he ruined the world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, well, but, he, no one cares about Zuckerberg anymore because Bezos is, is uh, overtaking him as the worst person in PR history. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. It, Elon keeps coming in and out too. And <laughs> Yeah, but he goes from battle. like up. He, Elon doesn't you know, Elon, like, I think just lives for this because he's like totally. everyone's favorite person for like five days. And then he's everyone's least favorite person for five days. And he just kind of does that. Well, all these guys get to play God. And when you get to do that, you get to kind of mess around with things. Like the fact that you can get on and basically screw with your, with your investors and your shareholders and not really care at all is like, it's saying something. I think he thinks he's above all of it. Um, it's an interesting thing to watch, man. That's probably. Sure. Well, yeah. it's, it's also just crazy that, you know, I actually kind of agree with his stand against California to a certain degree. Um, but it's just, it is kind of crazy how one person can force yeah. California to change the way it's doing things. And not only just change the way they're doing things, just change it for them. Yep. Yeah. Like he, 100%. Threatens to leave. he threatens to leave, which is a fair thing because he needs to keep his business rolling and then california bends to just him yeah i mean you have to look at it in percentages right like how much like the job market and what he brings to california and how much money and like it's just he knows that he, he obviously has the leverage so when an entire industry or entire company can do that like it says something about where we are too um, does. from an economic standpoint, but yeah, man, it's mm -hmm. it, like I said, it's interesting to watch uh, as long as we don't get caught up in the crossfire too much. Well, with all these people, there are a lot of positives and a lot of negatives. Yeah. And so goes the world. And I think that's what brings you here today. Um, <laughs> if that's a really piss poor, um, segue, but, um, I, I love looking into what you're doing. I mean, it's so cool. Thank you, man. So cool. L likewise, honestly, there's, you know, I've had great conversations across the board with a bunch of different people and, you know, humans are complex and we're made up, you know, we're kind of like, there's a dichotomy in all of us where, you know, and I'm a Gemini too. So it's just, I get it more than most, but, you know, we have different sides to us and we fall in line differently on different issues. And that makes us, you know, well-rounded human beings. And I think when you back yourself into a party, into a corner, into an echo chamber, you lose some of yourself. And it makes it harder to connect with other people and actually get things done. And, and I think that you see that and you embody that. And I think a lot of what you started with the ACC and your work, you know, especially at your age, being able to do that, I think um, is really admirable. And I'm, I'm excited to have this conversation because, 
you know, we are common ally, we are nonpartisan, but Mm -hmm. you know, people can look at even the word nonpartisan as like, nope, that's progressive. Like you're either blank or blank and it's, it's insane. Right. Um, so I admire what you're doing and I'm really excited to kind of talk through a lot of these things with you and let people hear a voice that is very important to be heard and also to prove that it's not a standalone voice. I mean, there's people behind you. Right. Well, I really appreciate that. And I mean, I would love to dive into this during the conversation, but I mean, it's just, it is, I used to be a fairly polarizing person. Um, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't a radical, but I was all partisan when I was younger. And it is so interesting when you expose yourself to other people, how much your perception on them and their beliefs change. And I think it's as simple as people need to needing to be exposed to it more. And I don't have the magic. I don't, I don't know if I'll ever have the answer as to how that's going to happen, but people don't like what they don't agree with, but often what they don't agree with is a lot closer to what they believe than what they think. Yeah, dude. Well said, man. That's, uh, that's honestly the ethos that I've always lived by. That's why we're called common ally. That is everything we're trying to achieve and just, you know, real quick, cause I want to hand the mic to you for, you know, the majority of this time, obviously. Um, but you know, my upbringing, I grew up in a small town in Connecticut, um, predominantly white, uh, working to middle class. Um, and we saw things through one lens, right? And like, if that's all you know, and that's the only people around you, you are going to adopt that. And it's not right or wrong. It's just what you know, it's in your, it's in your own echo chamber to an extent. Um, and then in my last, um, portion of my senior year of high school, I went to an art school in Hartford and it was way more diverse. I was the minority there. uh, And I was instantly exposed to different, different ways of thinking, different cultures, different everything. And it changed my entire life and my, my entire outlook on stuff. Cause I think I would have went down a very conservative path uh, had I not done that. And now, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I love kind of like being an independent and being able to take individual stances on things. So, um, so yeah, what you're saying is hundred percent right. How it should be. And yeah, exactly. That's, that's life. Right. So, um, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, so let's, let's dive in a little bit to yeah. the, the environment is obviously, you know, kind of seems to be your, your center of fuse and, and everything that you're working on. Um, I want to, First of all, why the environment? What made you do that? I know you're a hiker and a skier. Um, I'm a huge outdoorsman myself, so I can identify with why you want to protect the the spaces you love. Um, what's your yep. story? Why the environment? Well, I mean, to preface it on a general level, everyone is passionate about an issue because of an experience they have with that issue. It might be a negative experience or it might be a really positive experience. And that's how people rank what issues are important to them. Uh, that's why they believe what they believe. And before even diving into the environmental side of things, what I think is often lost in political conversations is that people don't realize that there's a reason why someone believes what they believe and they believe what they believe for, like, it may be the dumbest reason that you think is possible, or it might be a legitimate reason that you think is, is legitimate, but everyone has a reason to believe what they believe. And so Trump supporters have a reason to like Trump. Bernie Sanders supporters have a reason to like Trump. And they might really like something that that person does differently than you know, the opponent, or they might really dislike what the opponent does. And so they, they are flocking to you know, Trump or Bernie. But at the end of the day, I think we, what we really struggle with as Americans is trying to understand why other people believe what they believe. And there's almost always a valid reason. So, I mean, two examples would be, you know, if, if people are really pro Second Amendment and they hate, you know, the, the, the fact that people are advocating for gun control, what they don't realize is that a lot of people who are advocating for gun control either know somebody that have been harmed um, by guns or they are legitimately scared. And you can agree with them or disagree with them on that. But there is, there is, a legitimate reason why they believe what they believe. And of course, there are other reasons why you believe in gun control too, but th- there's a personal connection yeah. to, to issues like that. Now, on the, the conservative side, you know, conservatives often are, you know, anti-government. 
and or low go- or you know limited government well a lot of times that's because they feel like they've been screwed over through taxes or regulations that have harmed their family and prevented it uh, from for, or prevented them from having an opportunity to put food on the table and and grow their business and that's why my parents leaned conservative because they were small business owners and they felt like they really didn't have a chance to grow their business as much as they could because of government regulations and so you can disagree or agree with you know what the what the person's belief is but you have to understand that there's a reason behind it and someone is just as valid to believe in gun control as they are to believe in the second amendment yeah. and i'm not saying that you know either side is right on that what i'm saying is that you have to understand where they're coming from because there's a reason and that's why there are some issues that people don't really feel passionate about and that's why there are some issues that aren't even in the top 15 or 20 for people because they've never had an experience with it and so that leads me into why do I care about the environment? It's because I had an experience with it, many experiences with it that made me passionate about the environment at a young age. From going up to my cabin as a, as a young kid with my family every summer uh, on the shores of this tiny little lake in Wisconsin where I learned how to fish with my grandpa. And I, you know, we always threw the fish back in because we, we really valued the, the fish and, and we also were following the law, which we were not catching fish big enough to keep. Um, so there was, uh, we always had to throw it back yeah, in, which we, I hated it. And I'm like, oh, gotta, I really want to, it. I want to be the one who caught the fish and kept it. But I had those experiences as a kid and like, you know, just sitting around the campfire and my favorite memories from childhood are at that cabin. It's not, you know, it's not nestled in some huge mountain valley or anything crazy spectacular. It is simply in the woods by a tiny lake. And, you know, it, it, it's just, really special and peaceful and that connection at a young age just made me love insects and birds and and wildlife and also just the great outdoors as a kid it was all those exposures to nature that made me love it and obviously i've gotten more and more involved in doing outdoorsy things as i've gotten older but if i would have never been exposed to it i wouldn't care that much about it but because I was exposed to it, I care a lot about it. And when I, when I talk to people who maybe don't care about the environment or it's not at the top of their priority list, it's because they haven't had the same experiences. And that's not their fault, you know? Like, it's not their fault maybe that they weren't able to be exposed to the environment in the same way I was when they were a kid. And, you know, maybe they were exposed to something else in a different way. And so for me, it's like, I think a lot of people look at anti-environment versus pro-environment and that divide doesn't even exist. It's, it yeah. is literally a matter of what have people been exposed to and people are passionate about what they've been exposed to. Thankfully, I feel lucky because my number one issue is an issue that I am passionate about because I love it so much. And so yeah. it's a positive thing and it's something that I like get excited about every day. And you know, this weekend, I'm going to do everything I can to get out and do something about it. And right after this call, I'm going to get do something about it. So, you know, that's something that's really exciting. Um, and I'm just thankful to be able to fight for it on behalf of a, an organization that I started. Yeah, that's, that's heavy, man. That's great. That I think a few things that are really important there. First of all, I think humanizing the person on the other end. Um, and that has been a lost art form. Um, mm-hmm. You know, by you saying it's no fault of their own that they haven't been exposed to nature, um, right? You, you are 100% correct in that. But it also does not give that person the right to then just discount the person right. on the other end. And that's what ends exactly. up happening is like, I understand if you don't get something, then either yep. learn it or, or it's my job to help you see through my lens so mm-hmm. we could then come together. And I want to see through your lens. Like I want to be able right. to understand where you're coming from. Right. And I think you're right. There's no, like, I care about the environment and I don't care about the environment. I think that's a very small part of the population. I think it's, I care about the environment. And if you don't have exposure to it, it's, I care about the economy and I'm going Mm. to sacrifice the environment for it. Whereas, you know, what I see you getting involved with the ACC and, 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 and we'll get into that obviously. Um, but, and I think anyways, from a conservationist point of view is you see a marriage of the two. Right. And, yeah. and I want to kind of talk about that a little bit too. Yeah. Of, you know, I'm a big John Muir fan. John Muir was a, prove- a, 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 a why can I? Preservationist. Sorry. Thank you. Preservationist. Um, you know, and Pinchot was a, was a conservationist, right? And the, the difference between 
um, preservation versus conservation, um, you have taken conservation as your path. Can you talk a little bit about those differences and why you see that as the answer? Yeah, well, I think, you know, to, to start it off, I mean, John Muir is still a legend in my eyes. Um, he also went to the University of Wisconsin, which I there live in go. Seattle now. Can tell I, I do love my state of Wisconsin and there's some Wisconsin I love everything public. happening there you know. yeah there is a lot happening <laughs> take it all in we got a Packers clock we got a Reagan poster we got it all back there um, <laughs> I, I mean people like simple walls I don't you know put fill as, fill it as much as you can I'm with you. it's all the way over here so um, <laughs> but I mean I, I love John Muir and he's a Wisconsin grad but and he's a huge reason why we have national parks, which is obviously so important. Um, but the reason why conservation, I think, is more important is, at least here in the 21st century, is because, partially because humans have screwed up in uh, screwing with the environment. And we have yeah. cut down a lot of trees, and we have over overplanted trees in certain areas, which has caused problems. We have cut species from being part of our ecosystem. And we've also increased populations of species because other species have been cut. We've screwed with wildlife. And that's not just gonna return to normal on its own. And we also have to deal with the realities of, that, of those situations. And the best way to do that is with the best science and, and knowledge that we have to have a hands-on approach to manage wildlife populations so that they're at their most natural levels as possible and that they can keep the ecosystems healthy and to manage the forests so that we can make sure that they're healthy and that you know we mitigate as much as possible forest fire damage. And, and so it's just like that hands-on approach of, of taking care of the environment because we know how to and also because of uh, kind of mitigating some of the problems that we as humans have created for our environment. Yeah. I also think that this conservation view is what spurs interest in the environment. Because if you have a hands-on approach and you're able to engage with nature, you are able to know how important it is to protect it for future generations. And so me going on hikes and, you know, going fishing and doing those things, that's not really preservationist, that's conservation. And that's why I love the environment so much. And so that's why, I mean, some of the most passionate environmentalists actually end up being hunters and anglers, as much as people don't like to admit that, because they're the ones who are out in nature all the time. And they, yeah. they have that same special connection, and they want to preserve it for their kids and their grandkids. And so that's why I think that's the most important approach. And just because we as humans are part of nature, we're part of that ecosystem. And for that, for us to thrive, the environment needs to thrive and vice versa. We need the environment uh, ourselves. And so if we're, if we're relying on the environment a lot, we are going to have to extract resources. We're talking on a computer uh, video that is created via resources that we don't even really want to know about. And that's the tough reality of humanity. But people don't want to give that up to just save the environment. And so you have to marry the two so that you can continue growing the economy and, and protecting the environment at the same time. And the only way to do that is to be, you know, considerate of what's going on in the environment as you're using the environment to your own benefit and making sure that as much as possible, you're preserving and conserving uh, wildlife and ecosystems for future generations. And the reason that matters to people um, in the environmental community is because they're passionate about it. But the reason why it should matter to people who maybe aren't uh, taking the environment as a priority is because we do rely on the ecosystems uh, for our livelihoods, not just for resources, which, which is a very obvious thing, um, but also for the health of our livelihoods. You look at COVID where right now people are wanting nothing more than going outside and breathing fresh air. And they want nothing more than uh, a less polluted Los Angeles into the future. If that's the truth, that's because we, we as humans are supposed to be outside. We're supposed to be not cooped up in our rooms all day, every day. And that's because we rely on nature, even though we don't know it. Like even just simply rolling down the window as you drive home from work 
is embracing nature because you, you, you love that fresh air. It's just that feeling you're, you may not be a dog with your tongue out the window, but you're pretty much a dog with your tongue out the window when you're rolling down. You're just like, Holy crap. I love summer. I love this fresh air. I just, you know, this is amazing. There's a reason for that. It's not just because like you're some random person that loves to roll down your window. It's because of fresh air. So I just think that we oftentimes for those who don't necessarily marry the economy and the environment, uh, we should do so more because we often forget how much we rely on the environment for our success as humans and also the obvious economic impl impl implications of uh, resource management and the like. Yeah, no, good, good answer, man. That's, um, I, I'm with you on that. I, I think if I was to play devil's advocate, I would just say, um, you know, when you say like, we also use the resources, like clearly we do. And I love that you brought up the point that, a lot of times we want to extract the things that we don't want to really admit to. You know, if you take, for instance, like people like, well, how do you fish? That's so cruel to the fish. It's like, you just ate a can of tuna, which is part of a overfishing, <laughs> like, you know, like, yeah. in, but people kind of negate that fact that if you actually go out there and pull, catch a fish yourself, bring it home, fillet it, eat it, it's better than actually contributing to, you know, overfishing. Um, places right. that are really have sensitive ecosystems. And I think that's yeah. one example of how we kind of forget that we actually play a role. So, so yes, a hundred percent. But when it comes to tapping resources and, and taking an economic approach, I, I totally see that, but I think you have to a rely on good actors in that scenario who, especially if we do ease up regulation, you have to trust that whoever that person is who is extracting resources is doing that in a way that has the same sensibility that you thoughtfully have, right? So mm -hmm. that's one assumption we have to make. And the other assumption is, you know, where's the line? Like um, if we put a wind farm somewhere, maybe a, that's more understandable than if we're fracking there. So mm -hmm. where's the line for you and for the American Conservation Coalition, which you are the founder and president of, like where does the organization stand on that? I, I know, I think I read nuclear and renewables were, were part of that. And, and I you know, definitely wanna have a side question about nuclear, but um, can you speak to um, specific resources and how you see that working? Yeah, I mean, and that's the that that's the tough. Those are the tough questions, and those are the questions that, as an organization, it is it is consistently hard for us to figure out the answers to, because as with any stance on any issue, nobody has it all figured out, and I think that that's also important to admit. And and the reason why I say that is because I don't think that there is a line in the sand that you can draw on this. I also think that it's on a case by case basis because these these issues are so complicated that, you know, drilling in, in the middle of an Alaskan mountain range is a lot different than drilling in the middle of Texas. Um, and that's just the, no matter how you feel about fracking, that is so true. And, you know, taking, um, taking a deer species from overpopulated Wisconsin and then taking a deer species from California where it's like pretty unlikely to run into a deer, those are also different scenarios. And so I think that there are different lines that have to be drawn, which is why we feel like it's really important for the local government, state government, and federal government to yeah. have a role in these conversations because these issues aren't as simple as saying you can't do this and you can do that, or you can't do this on this land and you can do this on that land um, because it is just so complicated. But as a conservative and as somebody who believes in limited government, we have to understand that the environment is a finite resource and something that we have uh, hurt through a negative externality. And for those who don't know what that is, it's basically we all use it, but we don't realize we're all kind of contributing to its downfall because we're always like, oh, well, someone else will drive less yeah. or someone else will do X, Y, or Z. And so we have to understand that. And that's why as a conservative, I do believe that the government has a role in protecting these areas, um, in addition to the, the amazing potential that markets and individuals have to be a part of that equation, maybe more so than they have been. And so it's a matter of thinking about how we can be smart with regulations, and maybe instead of always leaning on the federal government, we look more towards local and state officials when we can, and we also look uh, more towards maybe an incentivized approach rather than a, a regulate a regulated uh, heavy-handed government hand 
coming down and saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. So I think there's two parts of that. One is that it's very complicated and that it, it does really have to happen on a case by case basis. And the second is, as the environment is a ne negative externality, we have to be smart about how we take care of the resources that we have, maybe in a different way than looking at an issue like taxes in general. Um, because you know, if you're talking about an income tax and the size of government, that's a lot different than talking about national parks and the size of the government, in my opinion, because there's, there's a huge difference there. So um, in terms of a negative externality. So that's what I would say to that. And then for us, you know, it is definitely one of the tougher questions that we face on how how we kind of balance those things. And you know what we've found is that this, as I was alluding to earlier, this carrot approach is rather than a stick approach of incentivizing people rather than regulating them tends to work out a lot better because people are then inclined to do the right thing rather than trying to prevent themselves from doing the wrong thing and oftentimes trying to skirt around it because they know they can avoid the government's wrath uh, through whatever loophole or just because they won't get checked on or just a negative like, oh shoot, they're gonna punish me for an endangered species being on my property. Now I hate endangered species because I don't want the government to come and take my property. So it's kind of that like kind of reversing the scenario of, okay, let's look at the federal government first and look at a regulation. Instead of doing that, let's look, can a local government handle this, okay? Can a state government handle this? If not, then can the federal government handle this? And if the federal government needs to handle it, can it be an incentivized approach or not? And then lastly, go to regulation if none of those other things are possible to protect the environment. So that's kind of the approach that we like to take when we're looking at this. Yeah, that's great. And, and I think, you know, all politics are local. And I think looking at your backyard first is a way to do that, especially something as global of cl as climate change. It's very hard for people to wrap their heads around it. So to personalize that and put it in their backyard, I think it's easier for them to, to buy in and get on board to be part of that solution. Um, and, you know, I, I like what you're saying. And I love that like reverse psychology and the rewiring the conversation and, and changing the narrative around instead of like bringing the hammer down, let's incentivize. Like, I really think that's a, a positive force for good. And I almost think, you know, you say like local, state, federal, uh, and at the federal level, you incentivize. I almost think you could do that from the ground up. Like, and that's kind of, you know, and we're playing with that too at Common Ally as far as like, you know, gamification and just healthy dopamine and like rewarding people for being civically engaged. Because if you're going to reward anything, and I feel like everything's rewarded these days, like reward that, right? So um, I think in the same light for what you're talking about, those kind of mechanisms can be implemented kind of everywhere. Um, so I think that's a really smart approach. And, and I love also just real quick, the, the yeah. we don't have the answer is is so honorable and like honestly like it's refreshing because you just don't hear that anywhere especially for our quote-unquote leaders who are supposed to be leading that next generation uh i feel like your generation is taking that mantle because no one speaks like that anymore <laughs> well that's definitely frustrating and and to go back on your your last point i mean it is just so frustrating how little people rely on local governments or get engaged with local governments because all politics is local and as much as that sounds cliche it is so true that is where the decision making happens that affects your day-to-day -day life and while the debates between trump and biden are going to matter this november the biggest debate that you should be worried about are the ones that are local yep. and if you're not paying attention to those and you're blindly going in to fill out your ballot and you only know who to vote for at the top of the ticket, you haven't done your civic duty. I'd rather have you not know who to vote for at the top of the ticket as long as you know who to vote for in the rest of the ballot. Because at the end of the day, that's where the real decision matters. And people aren't engaged enough in that and they don't have enough great candidates and they don't have enough great representation because no one even knows that some of these positions exist. But they're the ones who are making the decisions for your everyday life. And so yeah. that, is, that has been something that we have been hammering on as an organization is yes, you know, we're active on the federal level and trying to change this dialogue about how climate change doesn't need to be a polarizing partisan issue. But at the same time, get involved with your local you know, area, figure out how these issues affect you locally, how they affect you tangibly. Don't try to tell people about some pie in the sky thing, whether that's climate change or, uh, or uh, affecting polar bears or Joe Biden's blah, blah, blah. I mean, 
people, that's just like way out there for them. That's DC or Antarctica. I mean, that's not relatable. Yeah. What people relate to is what's in their backyard. I mean, I can relate to uh, Seattle, Washington issues so much easier than I can relate to something in Louisiana, but that's because I live here. And that's because I understand what goes on here because I live here. And yeah. that's where we should be putting most of our time and energy. It, it's a two-sided coin, you know, like, first of all, people need to be more engaged. They, they need yeah. to certainly look locally. Um, but that flip of that is local governments are not set up to entice and engage their constituents like a federal, you know, right. like someone running for president or, you know, some of the bigger, bigger tickets there, like down ticket is something that most people don't even understand. And that's because right. they've cut civics out of schools. That's because local governments don't have the budgets to really let people understand what's happening. It's not interesting. Like town halls run by 70 year olds is not going to really appeal to an 18 year old who, who might actually find value in it if it was communicated differently, right? Like, so I think there's, and government works slower anyways, so I understand that. Um, but I also want to be careful to not just put it on people of like you're being lazy or like get right. involved, damn it. Because I think there are forces working against a lot of people and, and other communities have that harder than, than others, sure. right? Like I live in Santa Monica and like we're pretty privileged here in Santa Monica. Like I, I'm basically living on soup cans and you know, like, so yeah. it's not that, but I mean, just geographically, we certainly have more at our disposal than other communities. And I don't want that to be lost in the conversation, but I'm, I agree with you a hundred percent though. Yeah. And I think it's important to understand those differences, but also try to, you know, if people are engaged instead of always relying on the federal government for yeah. their interests in politics, try to get involved in the state and local level. And I mean, your voice matters so much more when it's that local. I mean, I, I remember volunteering for a, a local assembly race, which was the state house in, in Wisconsin. Um, and my candidate won the primary by like, I don't know, 50 some votes. Hmm. And I had poured in like 40 hours a week for this guy. And I probably swayed those 25 people that could have gone to the other side and made the difference um, yep. over those 50 votes. So just knowing that at, at, as like a young person, I think I was probably 12 or 13, was just like, oh my God, I can make a huge difference. Yeah. And I think part of the reason people don't get active, there's many reasons. Um, one of the reasons is because they don't feel like they're going to make a difference. It's like, it feels like this huge, you know, mountain to climb. And it's like, well, if you're not Ben Shapiro or, you know, AOC, you're not going to make a difference. And it's like, that is just not true. Yeah. And I think we've discouraged action partially because we've diluted it to the point where people just every an everyday person doesn't feel like they can make a difference when in reality as much as money plays a role in politics and as much as you know big talking heads play a role in politics individuals may not have as much power as they did before but we sure do have a hell of a lot more power than we think we do yeah i agree how, how do you show people that like how do you show people that end result is it data is it like some sort of result mm -hmm. where you prove that look look at what has happened. How are you doing that? So for us, when we're trying to do it on an ACC level, we talk about how when we get even a couple dozen students to reach out to an elected official, we can, we can be the difference between them co-sponsoring or not co-sponsoring a bill, you know, voting one way or voting the other way. And if we can involve a student or a young person in that and then tell them, you were the difference between this bill passing or this person co-sponsoring or whatever. Um, that is really powerful. I also tend to use the personal story of when I was getting started when I was young. And then we also hear elected officials um, on the climate Republican side of things tell us all the time that they don't hear from anybody in their own constituency. And even if they heard from 10 Republicans from their district on climate change, they would be more willing to to make this a priority. And so it's like, you could be one of those 10 people, yeah. right? Like, and you could, you probably know nine other people, right? You probably know nine other people. So you could just yourself be the, the difference. And if, if you don't want to reach out to those nine people, then, then fine. But you could be one of those 10 that makes that difference. So, I mean, those personal anecdotes are there. And then there's obviously data to back that up as well. Yeah. That's um, yeah. Uh, okay, good. Good to know that that's happening and that that's what people are looking at um, to encourage kind of repeat action there. Um, 
you know, there's a lot of things that I hear you say um, with limited government, caring for the environment, finding common ground. And, you know, in my, my partisan part of my brain, right? Like I skip from conservative to libertarian to progressive. <laughs> why, why even hold conservative as a title? It, mm. I mean, you, you preach nonpartisanship. You're working mm. on the behalf of the greater population of the country and the world. Mm -hmm. why, why identify? Yeah, and that is, that's a really good question. One of the reasons that we do that, and the main reason, is because we believe that those values uh, that the conservative movement was founded on, which is limited smart government, not no government, but limited smart government, as well as fiscal responsibility, are the way forward uh, on the environment. And we used to have an environmental responsibility part of conservative. I mean, we have a heritage of conservatives on the environment that I try to go through with every new audience that I talk to, which is pretty much every Republican president before President Trump was actually known for their environmental record in one way or another. And it has like a historical, like they've been the beacon of whatever uh, accomplishment, Endangered Species Act, National Parks, EPA, largest marine sanctuary of all time, most public land set aside, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are Republican presidents, conservatives. So we talked about that. Um, but we believe that the conservative values are, are the most likely to solve the problems that we face environmentally and that they are the best to solve it through a conservation lens. But you bring up an interesting point, which is that, and this is something that maybe you were alluding to, maybe you aren't, which is that conservative doesn't necessarily mean that anymore. It doesn't necessarily mean limited government or fiscal responsibility or environmental responsibility. And as an organization, we are really struggling with that fact because we're conservative in the way that it was meant to be, right? The way that it was, it was portrayed, it was created and the way that it has portrayed throughout most of history. But that has started to shift. And the conservative that we know today is not based on values i would I, and i and i'm not here to say that liberalism is necessarily as based on values as it used to be either but like conservative is not based on the values that i joined the movement on so we are toying with that and i mean as an organization we've started to message it rather than saying conservative which can be misconstrued uh, by a lot of folks um or seen in a light that we don't want we have started to lead more on the fact that we're limited government, smart government, fiscal resp fiscally responsible environmentalists. And obviously it's not ideal and it's not what we would like to have to do, but that's the reality because yeah. in the past conservative meant those things. Today, it's not so much the case. And that's been something we've really struggled with. But the other important reason why we focus on conservatism is because you need to have both sides at the table on an issue like the environment if it's ever going to be progressed in the right direction. And right now, there's one side at the table, which I've got a lot of problems with kind of how they've approached it, but there's one side at the table, which is the liberal leaning side. And conservative side the conservative side has been pretty silent over the past couple decades. And to do that, you need to get that community re-engaged, to get those elected officials or decision makers or business leaders re-engaged on climate or conservation. You have to engage that base. And you're not gonna do that by going into it saying that you're just another liberal environmental group. Um, and that's not what we are. So it's important for us to have that community understand that we're speaking to them in, in, in their language um, as much as there are hopefully a lot of true conservatives left um, and continue building that base and then bridging the divide from there, which we've been able to do a lot of. Yeah. And I understand the difficult position and not, you know, I, we are nonpartisan through and through. I am an independent, um, you know, and I think that I, I hold that dearly because I think it's really important. And I think your generation, especially, I think that the data is there as well, that the majority of young people, Gen Z millennials uh, identify as independents. They might still vote, in line with a party the, most of the time, uh, but they see themselves as independent. And I think that's almost equally as important. Um, but it, I'm glad that you're seeing this as, look, through and through, we believe in conservative values. However, we also understand that those values 
aren't attached to what being a conservative means anymore. And I think that's in flux. So it's good that you're aware of that and trying to kind of, you know, reposition yourselves in a world that is now. Um, Cause while it would be great to be able to attach that, if it doesn't exist, there's no point of attaching to it anymore. Um, so I, I understand that that's not an easy thing to answer. Right. Um, yeah, for sure. It's a great question though. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? Because everything you're saying, it feels like the future of a solution. If we're going to save our democracy, if we're going to save our environment, if we're going to protect the things that we all collectively love, like we really can't attach to these dinosaurs that are no longer. And I think both two parties in this two party system are factioned and we're living through that. Right. So it's hard, hard to see that we still see this as Democrat Republican, but really there's like micro organizations within both parties that I think when we're maybe long gone, it would be laughable to think that we actually thought of this as a two party system. And so it's harder when you're in it to see it, but uh, I think your eyes are on that. And I was just curious to see um, what that means for you and for the organization. Well, I think that that's a really interesting point because over the course of history, obviously political ideologies have shifted and parties kind of spots and that's happened throughout history. Uh, But at the end of the day, I feel like we're going through that again, potentially. And (laughs) Democrat and Republican do not mean what they meant 10 years ago at all. And Anyone who knows politics knows that. And actually, you've, you've actually seen a decent shift of Republicans 10 years ago who would have supported a John McCain reluctantly support like a Joe Biden type. And you've seen people who would have supported a Barack Obama, Joe Biden type actually go over to the Trump camp. And that's because both sides are just kind of like, for better or for worse, they don't really represent like a strict ideology anymore. It's yeah. just kind of a convoluted grouping of ideas that actually shifts based on what the other side does. Yeah. So like if one side's for this, then the other side's for that and the opposite. And that is actually what has happened. I mean, 10 years ago, Barack Obama was advocating for like common sense immigration restrictions and, and Bill Clinton was too. And now that is the complete opposite of what's happening. And then today you're seeing, um, you know, you're seeing the Republican Party, which was just hammering on Barack Obama for spending money. Uh, You're seeing them excuse the dramatic ramping up of the national debt that we have in the United States and spending trillions upon trillions upon trillions of dollars and bailing out industries that might not even need it. So it's like, I mean, those things switch all the time. Yeah. And yeah. that's actually why I consider myself a independently minded person too, an independent, because there, there is no rhyme or reason. And I'd rather hitch myself to my values rather than an ideology that is constantly shifting. Good. That's great. Well said. Um, I think that's the answer. And I think a lot of people are coming to that same conclusion. Uh, it's just harder to try to attach yourself to it something that doesn't feel genuine. Yeah. Well, and if you're not super involved in politics, which most people aren't, mm-hmm. they don't have the time for that uh, because they're doing other things with their lives, like yeah. working and, and taking care of their family and friends. If you don't have time to engage in a serious level, you don't have time. Like the easiest thing is to cling on to like a faction, right? Like it's just really easy to like identify as something like identifying as simple as like a gender all the way to a political party. Like it's just something that like you can very easily identify with something with politics being so complicated. The easiest thing is to identify with a party. And that has, you know, created problems now that the party system is shifting more rapidly than ever before. And you have people flip flopping with the party they identify with all the time. Yeah. And I think we're, you know, we're complicating that with the way that media runs now and the onslaught yeah. of social media and trolls and all these things. That, well, it's, not a me- it's, it's not media. It's not even, it's not news. It's, it is simply no, no. opinion. Yeah. Well, hundred percent. I mean, I'm saying media in the sense of social right. media really where right. people are, it's algorithms is what it is. It's not news. It's not even people at this point. It's literally like, Hey, he clicked on that. Let's show him a bunch of that. Like, you know, well, and people are able to just stay down that lane. The most disturbing part of it is that 
people people really get screwed over by that too, not only like unknowingly, but you know, I was in a very, very, very major news outlet with a headline that did not reflect my opinions whatsoever and misconstrued everything that I said with a reporter that I really like as a person. And I, I, I contacted them and I said, Hey, like, this is not okay. This is super misleading. And they said, Hey, sorry, it's what, it's what got the best reactions with our algorithms. I mean, flat out said that. (laughs) We AB tested this and it looks better. No, literally uh... they said they AB tested it. (laughs) Yeah, of course. And this was, this was a major news publication that, is a, it's a major, major news publication. I'll just say that. <laughs> it is probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest. And the problem with that is even a person who likes me, and I like them, I totally do, no, no hard feelings now, still did that. Mm-hmm. And so that's, and that's where the divide comes from, is this, it's all based on clicks and it's all based on the, the, the viewership it's not based on telling the news and even though people want the news and not opinion there's not going to be ever in my opinion an uprising enough to change that really until people truly stop feeding into it because everyone wants better news or they actually want news but they still tune in to fox news or cnn every night and they're just feeding the beast and they're like oh well this story looks really interesting. So even though I want real news, I, I think I'm just going to read this one. It's kind of like that same problem with the environment. It's like, well, s- some other time I'll handle that. And some other time I'll worry about the media being super biased. But for now, I'm going to stay in my lane and, and watch it. And yep. it's like, it's, it's so frustrating. I think that you and I should collaborate and create an opposite click day and just get everyone <laughs> to click on something that they don't believe in to just mess up all the algorithms everywhere. That'd be um, great. So let, let's work on that. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I've seen that a lot. I've seen family members and friends kind of, you know, really go off the rails and go down this way that just is not them. It's not what they truly believe in. It, it's not who they are as a person. But I know the media loop that they are caught up in. Um, and that goes for both sides. That is, you know, ultra liberal, ultra conservative, where these people were not either of those things before. So I think, you know, it's feeding the beast. It's a media diet that they're not in control of. And then to your point earlier, they're working 40 plus hours a week. They have children, they have bills to pay. You know, we're realizing now with with the pandemic too, how many people actually had $500 in their account? Like, you know, that was thrown around a lot of just like the average American only has 500 in savings. Right. And now we're seeing 30 million of them filing for unemployment. Um, and, and that's, that's coming true. Right. So when you are, when you're in that situation with more of us are than we'd like to admit, um, it's very hard to, to pay attention on a different level. And, and like you said, like, it's hard to like realize all these things and focus on it because you don't have the time and that is being taken advantage of a lot by both parties and by media conglomerates and, and, you know, other forces out there that get to benefit off of that disinformation and misinformation. Well, the big problem with that is what I found at first, I just thought these people were ill-intentioned who were like running these things, but they're not, they don't have ill intentions. They are just justifying it because it's their job and because they want to keep like moving forward and they don't even know what they, they, I mean, of course some do, but most, most of the people that I, that I know who are in those positions don't even know that they're doing what they're doing. And they're just thinking that that's the norm. And like, I'll just, you know, that's my job. I'm supposed gotta, to do that. I have to push back on that though. Like you got to do better. Like I, I get that. And like, not everyone but is they've been, weed, so, but... they've been so caught up in it that they yeah. just don't reflect on it. And I think that that's actually a societal problem. I mean, it's really hard for us to reflect on things these days even when we aren't caught up in a 50 hour, 60 hour, 70 hour or a hundred hour work week, we're on our phones or we're doing some other short term thing. We're never like reflecting. Yeah, and that's true. if you're, if you're like constantly rising up the ranks in a news company, you slowly become like, I don't want to say brainwashed, but sort of 
um, into thinking that that's like, okay. Like at first you start out by run, like reviewing the algorithms and you're just kind of reviewing it and that's okay because you're just reviewing it. You're not part of the decision-making process. And then you know, you start slowly going up. I mean, I'm not saying it's not their fault. I'm just saying that it's like, it's also not, not their fault. I, I just think it's, it's so complicated. Yeah. It's, people just don't reflect anymore. No, that's a great point, man. There's, you know, both sides of that. There's the not being able to reflect is such a good point. I'm glad you bring that up. Like just even in conversation and dialogue, like I cherish dialogues that we're having right now because you don't get to do that. It's always, no. you guys talk at each other and then go out and then get on to to Instagram and do something vapid, right? Like there is no like sitting down and actually marinating thoughts. And, and so I, I get caught up in it all the time. I mean, I really do. do. Yeah. Yeah. We all do. I, just, I think it's, it's necessary to, to realize that and then kind of reel ourselves out of it a bit. But, you know, if you look at things like Theranos or Cambridge Analytica or, um, you know, some of these well-documented cases where like some shady shit was going on, right? And then you end up having your whistleblowers or people who are just like, look, I was looking at this thing all the time. And at first I thought that, but then like, I really saw this and, and I couldn't stand for it anymore. And I had to say something. And I think in Hollywood, you know, you're seeing that too with the, with, you know, the me too, what Weinstein stuff <clears throat> happening there. Right. Like, you know, I used to work in acquisitions in, in Hollywood for a while and I, I didn't see that stuff, but you know, I definitely saw things that were like, wow, you're, you're very shady, you know, and like <clears throat> this industry is very shady and there's things here that you could not get away with anywhere else. And I think it just takes people saying, you know, I can't do this anymore. It's just, it's breaking me down moralistically and I need to say something. So it, that is a smaller piece of the population. I agree with you that most people are just caught in it and don't see it, but there's other people who do and just need to actually step up and say something. Yeah, I agree. And I, I also think that sometimes it's that person who steps up and says something that actually helps the others realize <clears throat> what's actually going on totally. because it might take that one whistleblower to, to wake up the, 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 the low level analyst to say, Whoa, wow, I have been doing that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even realize it. And I mean, you see that every day in your everyday life, like people telling you something and it just makes you kind of go like, wow, I didn't realize I was doing that. Could even be in your relationship, right? Like you might be totally not being, um, Care, caring about your significant other and you don't realize it right like you're just it's just you're you're, you're getting deeper and deeper into it until at, they're at a breaking point where they're like okay I actually have to talk to you about this and you go shoot yeah. like I am so sorry I mean that's happened to me so many times and and so that's why like these whistleblowers especially if they're you know if they're being truthful about what they're what they're saying are just like so badass because it's like you you're setting the precedent and you're actually helping so many more people than you think you're not just helping the victims you're helping the victimizers oftentimes realize what they're doing yes. and they can also step back and stop doing it or they, at least they have the choice dude that's a great point i'm really glad you said that yeah you don't see it and i think using that analogy of your own relationships it does. Like you see things through a lens of like, God, why is she doing that? I don't understand why she does that. And then the minute yeah. she turned around and says, I'm doing this because of blank. You're like, Oh, I'm the monster. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. And I'm going to change. I've um, definitely been there. <laughs> yeah. Me as well. Um, I think we all have. So that's, that's a good way to kind of like frame that and let people really understand what, what that is. Um, I know we're probably past our time. I don't know what your schedule looks like, but I'd love to get into a little bit I've more. I've got a few more minutes. Okay. I would much rather get into 2020, the youth yeah. vote, where we're going to find common ground across the parties. I feel, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like your generation uh, is less polarized. It sees eye to eye on a lot more, especially the environment. And I think that's one that is a rallying call for people to then realize they can work with other issues. But all right, what's the formula for getting people out and together in 2020. So, if 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 I knew the if I also knew the answer to that question, I'd be a very wealthy person, and I'm living in this tiny room in Seattle. But I've got some ideas. So that's <laughs> um, what we're asking for. Uh, you know, we have to, as other young, passionate people, we have to make people feel like their voices matter, and that goes back to what we were talking about earlier. I mean, I saw yesterday a bunch of my fellow conservatives talking about, you know, the 
the fact that most young people don't really believe in America anymore. And that was like totally appalling to them. And while I obviously love the United States of America, um, I also understand where they're coming from because they've grown up in this really divisive time with two recessions and all these different problems that have gone on. And do they really truly think that their one vote is going to change that? No, they don't. And they feel kind of hopeless in terms of politics. So as young people, they need to, A, hear more conversations like the one that we're having, but also help, we have to help them understand how much their, their vote and their activism matters. And that's why, I mean, I really hate when, uh, you know, conservatives shoot down Greta, people like Greta, obviously she's not American, but, you know, people like her. And who you were on the hill with, right? Yeah, and I testified at Congress with her. But I've gotten my fair share of left-leaning people shooting me down because of my age all the time too. So we have to stop that, first of all, because I don't necessarily agree with what Greta says all the time. But that's okay, because I know that she's inspiring a lot of people to take action. And that's way better than people sitting on the sidelines. So I guess, in general, we have to help people understand that their voice matters and not shoot them down for that. Um, And that and then also understand why they feel dismayed by the political process. And then, additionally, we need to, as again, young people who understand these issues, make the issues about us. Don't make it about these things that we don't care about. Make these issues about the environment, about uh, healthcare as we're about to, you know, go over 25 and be entered into that, uh, that mess that we have that it's the healthcare debate right now and talk about student loan debt. And like, like, let's make these issues our issues. Let's, let's change the world on them. Let's stop waiting for the older generations to make these issues their priority. They're never going to, a 75 year old white man is not going to make student loan debt his priority. He's not. Yep. And, and so unfortunately that's the truth. So we have to force them to do that as young people who are dealing with those crises every day. So I think as, as a generation, we need to do a better job of raising our voice, but there's again, a reason why we don't and understand how much our voice does make a difference. And I'll give you a reason. As much, or as, I'll, give, I'll give you a couple of examples. As much as young people feel like their voices aren't heard, some of the most famous politicians and political activists in the country right now are under 35. I mean, I don't like AOC at all. She is one of the most famous political voices in the country, and she's in her, I think, young, you know, young thir- or lower 30s. You have Greta uh, and all the other climate activists who are all under 25, including the Sunrise Movement, which is literally shaping Joe Biden's climate platform. I was the w- one chosen to testify at Congress with Greta. So as, a, as the conservative alternative, they could have picked, they literally could have picked anybody, an adult, you know, but they picked me. And so it's not all that people are shooting us down. It is young people who are actually changing the course of the future, no matter if you think that that's a good thing or a bad thing that is happening. So to to fellow young people, like your voice will be heard. And the more that we get out there, it will be heard. And then the last thing is that it can't just be about social media and making a name for yourself in politics. It's got to be about actually making the difference on the ground. It's going to be about phone calls. It's going to be about door knocking. It's going to be about petitions. It's going to be about, you know, having, writing op-eds. It's going to be getting your voice out there in a larger way than just posting something on your Instagram story. And even though that might make you feel good and, and it does make a difference in terms of like spreading awareness, we need to take Instagram activism and Twitter activism and turn it into real activism and have real conversations with elected officials and real conversations with companies and real conversations with political leaders. And if we don't like it, you know, stand up against it. And if we do like it, support it loud and clear so people know. And that's something that our generation needs to do better at because even during COVID, the amount of people who, you know, are posting different political things, um, is insane. And that's really great. That's the only thing that we can do right now um, in COVID. Um, But once that's over, can you take that passion for those issues that you're posting about and actually do something about it? Because that's where the difference is going to be made. I'm going to leave it there. I couldn't have said it better. Um, It's really inspiring. and And I hope people listen to every word of that because that is the future for sure.
Well, I mean, this has probably been one of my favorite interviews ever. Um, and I'm just super excited to share it out. And I'm also just so hopeful that our generation is going to change it. And we've got some work to do to do that. I'm not going to say that we are. People ask all the time, is your generation going to be the one to change it? And I say, I don't know yet. It's too soon to tell, but we've got a better opportunity than the current generation and we've got some work to do. So yeah. let's keep doing, doing the work that we need to do and, and, and continue changing, changing the course of history by at least uniting people as much as possible. I think we're never going to agree on everything and that's okay. We're going to have to set aside those disagreements, but if we agree three out of 10 times on something, let's work on those three together. And if we agree 10 out of 10 times on something, obviously let's work together. We should not be only agreeing or we should not be only working together when we agree 100% of the time. And that's why it's so fun to be involved in conversations like these is because obviously we agree more than three out of 10 times. But <laughs> you know, even if we did only agree three out of 10 times, I can guarantee we'd still come out of here with a smile on our face. Uh, we are 100%. I, <laughs> I consider you a common ally. <laughs> yes, sure, well, I am so excited about what you're working on so important and excited to continue supporting it into the future. So thank you so much for inviting me on. Thanks for coming, man. Really, really glad to have you. <laughs>